Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to show you how to use Substance Painter. If you've never opened Substance Painter before, this video is for you. We're going to texture this robot model from scratch, from start to finish. And when you're done with this video, you can go back to some of our other videos to learn some more advanced techniques. Now I was already working on this robot, creating some new texture variations, and we thought it would be really cool to share an untextured version of this model for all of you. And even though this robot is normally a pro model, we decided to share a free version for you guys so that you can follow along with this video. You can use any model that has a good UV map, but if you do want to use the robot, head over to RenderCrate and search for the worker robot. And just a heads up, if you have a free account, you may not see the free version here, so you have to actually click on the name Worker Robot, and you can see the free version right here at the bottom. And some really cool related news, we're actually working on a blender rig for this character so that in the future, you guys can make your own animations. So subscribe to the channel if you want to be notified right when that happens. Speaking of Blender, I'm just going to open the model in Blender really quick so we can check it out. First thing you'll notice is there are actually four materials. You can see if I click on the arms, there's the arms mat material, there's the torso mat material, the legs mat material, and the head mat material. Naming your materials properly is the most important first step when you get into Substance Texturing before you even open up the program. So this model is ready to go, let's hop over to Substance Painter. Okay, so here we are in Substance Painter. I've got my file prepared and I'm going to make a new project. Go to File, New. And here's where you can load the FBX that we were just messing with and set a few settings up. So here in the file I'm going to hit Select and I'll grab the WorkerBot FBX. And I'm going to set my initial document resolution. This is changeable later if you realize you set it to the wrong number, but I'm just going to crank it up to 4K. If you already have a normal map for this model, you would go here to the Import Texture Maps and add it here, but we don't have one, so we're just going to press OK. So we're just going to inspect the model really quick to make sure everything came out OK. Quick tip for hotkeys, if you press F1, you get this split screen view with the 2D window and the 3D window. If you press F2, it's just the 3D window, and if you press F3, you get just the 2D UVs. I'm going to press F1 for now so we see both views. So now look for the texture set list window. Mine is over here. Yours might be on the right side. I did kind of arrange my interface a little bit differently. But you'll notice that we have a different texture set for each of the materials that we saw in Maya. And notice that these texture sets are named the same thing as the material. So you can see why it was so important that we named our materials properly. Okay, we're not quite ready to get started texturing and let me just demonstrate why. If I grab one of these cool looking smart materials that comes with the program, like this bronze armor material and just drop it on the model, we'll see that it doesn't quite look as expected. If I look at the thumbnail for this material, it has more detail. We can see like the edges are picked out with little scratches and there's, there's dirt in the recesses. But when I drop it onto my model, I don't see that. It didn't work. So there are some things we have to do to get that to work. So what we need to do is bake our mesh maps. Now if you're in the newest version of Substance Painter, it's this little picture of a croissant right here. If you're using an older version of the program, it might be under texture set settings, and then you want to scroll down and click bake mesh maps. That'll do the same thing. In this newer version of Substance Painter, we have this all new baking window, but the controls are laid out basically the same. So if you have an older version of the program, you should be able to follow along. First thing I'm going to do is go to my common settings right here and change my project resolution to whatever I want it to be. I'm going to go with 4K. Now normally it's best practices to have a high res version of the model to bake our details with, or if we don't have that, the second best option would be to have a normal map baked from a high res map in uh, ZBrush or something like that. But we actually don't have either of those options for this project, so I'm going to click use low poly mesh as the high poly mesh. This character is pretty well modeled, it has some really nice beveled edges, so I think we should get an okay normal map and curvature map and all that out of our low res model. And you'll see what I mean in just a second here. So what we're about to do is bake some maps that give the model the information it needs to use those smart materials that I showed you earlier uh, properly. This is the list of maps that we're going to bake on the model. I'll explain each one and what they do after they're done baking. But for now, let's just run down this list and make sure the settings are set properly. So if I click on the normal option, I see there's nothing to change. So I'll move on to world space normal. Again, there's nothing to change here. So I'll click on ID and this could be set any way you want. But my preferred way of setting it is mesh ID and for color generator I'm going to set it to random. Again I'll explain what that means once the map is created and it'll make more sense. Okay let's go to the ambient occlusion and I'm going to increase the secondary rays and where this says self occlusion always I'm going to set this to only say mesh name. The reason for doing that is because this model has a lot of moving parts and if we bake the shadows from one piece of the model onto another It'll look cool when it's in this static pose, but once he starts animating, it's going to look weird that the shadows aren't changing. So we're trying to make sure that the individual pieces of this model don't kind of cross-contaminate each other. So let's go down to curvature, and normally for the method, 
we would set this to generate from mesh. And that's for if you have a high res version of the model, but we don't have that. So I'm gonna switch it to generate from normal map. And then you can experiment with increasing the details and see if you get a better result. For the position, I'm just gonna leave it how it is. And then for thickness, I'm gonna again, crank up the secondary arrays and then set the self occlusion to only say mesh name so that the parts again, don't cross contaminate each other. And then I'll press bake selected textures and wait for a few minutes while it does its thing. Now, if you notice anything looks weird, you can always press cancel bake. And it's gonna take a little while because it's creating all seven of these maps for all four of these texture sets. So it's a lot of a lot of maps. Okay, and it looks like it's done. Okay, now let's cycle through these maps and I can explain what they actually do. If you press B for bake, it'll start to cycle through the maps and the first one here is world space normal. So what this map does is it tells the computer which surfaces are facing in which direction. So if I look at the model from the top view, you can see it looks mostly green. So if we wanted to create like a dust layer that sits on the top of the model, we could use this map to constrain the dust to just the upward facing surfaces. The next map is that ID map we talked about where it just kind of puts a random color on every single individual part of the model. And what this lets us do is later on when we start texturing is I can apply different smart materials to just certain parts of the model just really quickly like this. So pretty handy. The next map is called ambient occlusion and it's basically shadows that are in the deep recesses. So if we wanted to create a dirty effect down in the deep recesses, this is the map that would help us do that. Next one is curvature. This one picks out the higher surfaces or the sharp edges. And we can see that ours looks a little bit faceted, a little bit low detail. And that's caused by the fact that we didn't use a high polygon version of this model. We just baked the, the uh, mesh maps based on the low res geometry, but that's okay. It'll work just fine for us in this case. This one's the position map. This actually shows the computer where each part is in space. So if we wanted to make it look like this character was walking through mud up to its knees, we could create a mud material and then mask it based on this gradient. So, you know, constrain the mud to just the reddish purplish parts of the model. This map is the thickness map and the brighter it is, it means the thicker the piece is. We probably won't use this too much, but it's there if we need it. And that's it. So if we press M for material, we go back to what the model actually looks like right now. Okay, and I'm gonna really quickly just test my maps to make sure they're working by grabbing one of the smart materials. That's the second tab right here. And I'll just use this bone stylized because it looks like it's going to work for us. And I can see that not only did I apply a material to the model, but that material is smart enough to know where the edges are and the deep recesses are based on those maps that we created. So I'm going to press undo and we're ready to start. Okay, so the way the Substance Painter works is you create a bunch of individual materials and you place them on layers. And then just like in Photoshop, you mask those layers to reveal whatever material is underneath. So let me just show you a really quick example of what I mean. I'm gonna switch over to my just base materials here. It's the farthest left little tab. And I'm gonna drag and drop this aluminum material onto the chest and you can see what we got. And then I'll grab any other material, like maybe this blue fabric, and I'll drag and drop that on there. So now over here in the layers palette, we can see we have two different materials, two different layers. And if I turn the visibility off of the blue one, we can see the gold one again. So we can create a layer mask on this fabric material to control where the fabric material is on the model. So I'm gonna click on this little icon and choose a black mask. And you can see this little square pops up, that's the layer mask. If you wanna actually be able to see the layer mask, there's a hotkey for that, just alt click on it. And now we can see it's all black, which means it's hiding that blue material. And I have a white paintbrush right now. If you don't see a white paintbrush, you can press X to toggle back and forth between black and white. So if I paint here with a white paintbrush, you can see I've changed that part of the model to white. I'm gonna press M for material to go back to what the model actually looks like right now. And you can see it's revealing that blue material on top of the gold one. So that's the essence of Substance Painter. It's just manipulating layer masks to achieve some really cool effect. So I'm gonna delete these materials. We wanna start with a plan. So I think I wanna create three different materials for this character. I want a chrome for kind of the mechanical bits that are actually moving parts. And then I want some of the parts to be black rubberized material just to kind of contrast to that chrome. And then I want a dirty yellow painted metal like a construction vehicle. So let's start with that chrome or that bare steel. So over here, I'm in the base material tab. I'm gonna search for metal and I'm gonna find one called, let's try steel rough, see what that looks like. Okay, looks pretty cool. Notice that it doesn't apply to my other texture sets, but that's okay, we can apply it later. So the first thing that I do whenever I apply a new material is I adjust the scale because it's almost always not quite the way we want it. 
And what do I mean by that? Well, if I sort of rotate the light by holding down shift and right click, I can see that the scratches and smudges kind of look like they're too big. Or you could think of it this way, it's almost as if the model is too small. You know, if there was a fingerprint that was the size of his entire chest, that would mean that he's a doll, right? So let's change the scale of this material. Down here in the properties, there's this tiling slider, and I can just turn that up and we get instantly more detail. So that's the very first thing I always do whenever I apply a new material. Now, I don't turn it all the way up. I kind of just adjust the slider until it seems right. And while we're here, we can adjust some other things if we want to. We can darken it by changing the steel color, or I can lighten it up. And then I can also adjust the roughness to make it more shiny or less shiny. Now, every material is gonna have different controls. Um, these are set up by users and a really unique material might have really unique sliders. It's just whatever's appropriate for the material. So for example, if I really quickly drop that previous aluminum insulator material on that we used earlier, uh, we can see this looks like pretty cool, interesting material. But if I open up the pattern, it has some sort of unique controllers just for this material. So I can adjust the folds intensity, the grid intensity, and so on. So always try to explore the materials and see what kind of options are available. Okay, so we've got the base chrome. I want to add a little bit of dirt to the chrome. So let's actually take this rust fine material and drag that on top, and we're going to turn this into a dust. So obviously it's way too intense right now, but I can change the dust color to be kind of a brownish gray. Uh, let's not forget to change the scale like I mentioned. And now I need to constrain this to just the deepest recesses, and I want it to be really faint. I don't want it to be a very extreme effect. So I'm going to click here, and I'm going to go to add a black mask. Now there's a really cool feature that allows you to very uh, quickly create interesting masks. So I'm going to click here to clear out my filter and I'm going to switch to the smart mask tab, which is the third tab. And I'm going to look for one where the preview looks like there's dirt sort of in the deep cracks of the model. And this one here called dust occlusion looks like the dust is sort of confined to the deep recesses. So let's drag and drop this onto our mask. So I saw it change, but it's very subtle. If you didn't notice it, you can toggle the layer on and off and see the difference. And you can see it's doling down the deep recesses and darkening them and taking away the metallicness of it. Again, don't forget, if you alt click on the mask, you can really see what it's doing. So this is where the dust is falling on the model. Now notice underneath the rust layer, there's this little icon now. This is how we're gonna control the mask if we wanna change it. So I could increase the dirt level. Um, let's say this dirt itself is the wrong scale. I can change the grunge scale. So there's tons and tons of options here. And every mask is, again, gonna have its own settings just like the materials do. So now if I toggle the dirt on and off, I can see it's not just in the recesses anymore, it's the surface of it. Okay, so we've created sort of a dirty chrome. I like to group my materials once I've done with them. So I'm gonna create a little folder and I'll call it dirty chrome. And let's drop these two inside of the dirty chrome folder. Very nice. Now let's try to make a black rubberized material for some of these parts so we have some contrast and kind of break up the monotony here. There's one called plastic granny. That sounds promising. Let's try that out. Okay, it looks a little bit extreme, but we can probably adjust this to make it look a little better. Let's first try increasing the tiling to lower the scale here. And I can see it's like a texturized rubberized material. Now if I go down into the technical parameters, maybe I can sort of tame down some of this bumpiness. If I go to the height range, I can maybe just turn that down. Looks like that slider doesn't do anything. Let's try the normal intensity. Ah, that's the one, okay. So in this case, it was normal intensity that was a little bit too high. Okay, cool. I'm gonna press C for color. And what this does is it actually cycles through your finished maps, like the ones that will be exported into Unreal Engine or whatever. So this is the color map, and I can see it's actually really boring. So let's press M to go back to material. I want to add a color variation that makes the higher surfaces a little bit brighter. Because a lot of times plastic materials um, on sharp edges, they get kind of bent. And when plastic stresses, it kind of changes color and gets a little bit lighter. Plus I think it's just gonna help with the contrast and sort of readability of this material. So I'm gonna add a fill layer, this little paint bucket. And what this does is it just adds a blank white shiny fill layer on top. I'm gonna to call this light edges. And I only want to adjust the color of the material. So I'm gonna go here to the channels and turn off metallic, height, normal, and roughness. Cause I don't wanna adjust the shininess or anything else about the material. And just like before, I want to mask this to just the sharp edges of the model. So I'm gonna click on this mask and add a black mask. And I could go through and add a smart mask like we did with the dirt, but I wanna show you how to build your own from scratch if you want to. So if you wanna just kind of start from scratch, start from the most basic mask, first make sure that you have your mask selected and then go to this little magic wand 
and then go to add generator. So generator is just a thing that generates a mask, a pattern of some sort. Right now there's nothing plugged in, but if I click here, the most basic one is called the mask editor and it's kind of just a no frills blank slate. It has all the options you could want, but by default it just picks out the edges. Now this is way too much. I can see that it's picking out way too many of the edges. So I'm gonna scroll down through all of these details to curvature and I can see that's the one that's turned on. Everything else is turned off. Curvature is the one that's causing this pattern. So you can actually expand this and tighten it up and kind of adjust where the color is falling on the model. So I can see that there's words like sharp, fine, soft, medium, large, big, huge. I'm just gonna turn down all the words that sound big and you can see it's kind of tightening up the map. So we get just the edges. We can also go up to the very top and turn down the global balance if we want. And that should sort of tighten it up a little bit. If you wanna see just the color map again, you can press C for color. And this is what the color map looks like. That's a little bit too perfect. So I'm gonna to go to blur and just kinda of soften it a little bit. Okay, let's group together the light edges and the plastic grainy, just like we did with the dirty chrome. So I'm gonna add a folder and I'll call this black plastic and I'm going to drag and drop these two layers into my black plastic group. Now what's really cool is the groups themselves can be masked off so I can actually click on my group and go to add a black mask and it will hide all of the layers that are inside. So now we can constrain the black plastic to just certain portions of the model. So let me show you how to do that. I've got my mask selected and I really don't want to manually paint going to take too long. So there's actually a really cool brush called the polygon fill right here. It's the fourth tool down. This is kind of like a paint bucket in Photoshop. It allows you to fill different parts of the model with the material. So right now it's set to face mode. And that means if I click on a face, it's going to fill just that face. If I click on this cube here, it's mesh mode and it's going to fill this entire object if I click on it. So now you can go around and just click all the parts that you want to be black plastic. Now let's say you accidentally click a part and you didn't want it to be plastic. Just set this to black. So now we're feeling black and we're removing the effect. I'm just gonna go through and pick out some areas that I think will look good. And maybe these hips will be rubberized. It's kind of cool. Yeah, I kind of like that. So let's create that one last material, the uh, yellow painted sort of dirty metal, like a construction vehicle. So for that, I'm actually gonna show you how to use a smart material. So what is a smart material? So a smart material is exactly like these base materials that we've been using, but it comes kind of pre-grouped inside of a group with multiple layers. Let me show you what I mean. I'm gonna switch over to my Smart Materials tab and I'm gonna search for Metal. And we can see that there's a bunch of really cool metal materials. I'm gonna grab this red one here that's called Steel Painted Scraped Dirty. You can pick whichever one you want. I'm gonna drop this onto the model and we can see that it is already in a group. Just like the other two groups that we made, like the Dirty Chrome and the Black Plastic, there's now one called Steel Paint Scraped Dirty. And if I open that up, there's actually a ton of stuff inside. So every smart material is gonna be very different from every other smart material there's no kind of universal pattern to how they're set up and some of them are user made so they might be kind of confusing what I recommend if you want to kind of dive in and dissect a smart material and figure out how it works is turn off every layer inside of the group until you get to the bottom and adjust each layer from bottom to top I'm gonna to start with the base metal and I can tell this is way too shiny for the look we're going for so I'm gonna increase the roughness to sort of dull it down I'm also gonna darken it I want it like a dark metal okay Looks pretty cool. Let's turn the paint layer back on and we can see that we have a nice red shiny paint and it's already masked off so that it's revealing the metal underneath along the edges. Now this mask is a little bit too procedural. So what we're doing is called procedural editing and a lot of times the default procedural masks just look computer generated and so they need some help. They need some adjustment. So I'm gonna click on this mask and I can see that there's one thing controlling the mask. Let's open that up. See if we can dissect it. I think the first thing is the edges are just too perfect. So I'm gonna go back into the curvature just like we did before. And it looks like this one's set up a little different, but the slider convex range is the one that sort of sharpens up those edges. So that's what I'm gonna do. Okay, looks pretty good. So I wanna increase the grunginess for some more random noise. So it's not just perfectly scratched along the edges. That doesn't feel real. It feels like someone did that on purpose by hand. So I'm gonna to go to the grunge tab and see what we can figure out. Maybe if I increase the grunge here, Ah, there we go. See how we're breaking up those perfect edges? I think the grudge might be the wrong scale, so inside of the grudge pull-down menu, we can increase the scale here and get some more detail. Nice, okay. I think I like the way that the paint is chipped, so let's actually click on the paint itself and make it yellow, because that's what our art director said we needed. Remember to keep your uh, plan in mind, or just go crazy. A little bit too shiny for me. Doesn't feel very utilitarian. Doesn't feel like a construction vehicle, so I'm going to increase the roughness. There we go. Okay, it looks like there's actually a layer here called Roughness Variation, and if I turn that on, we don't see a whole lot changing. 
I'm toggling it back and forth. But I can see, especially if you look right here inside the, the neck, inside the spine, we can see that the light on the surface is changing. So it's not actually changing the color or the metalness or anything, it's changing the shininess value. Now if you are having a hard time seeing what it's actually doing, remember that you can always press C for color and keep pressing it until you get to the roughness map and I'm going to turn it on and I can see that okay it's just breaking up the shininess so that there's noise in the shininess. Without the roughness variation it's an even level of shine across the whole model and that can feel a little bit fake and sort of computer generated. So this map is designed to break it up so that the shininess itself, the, the clear coat, is kind of cloudy. I like it. Okay next one up is dirt. This one looks okay but again it's a little too uh, sharp and sort of computer generated so I'm going to click on the mask and let's see what we can do. Okay, this is the first time we've encountered this. Inside of the mask, there's actually multiple objects. So what we have is layers inside of a layer mask. So this program can really get very complex very quick, but just remember to always start at the bottom, like I recommended, turn off everything above it, start at the bottom and adjust that, and then turn on the layer above it and adjust one at a time from bottom to top, and it should start to make sense to you. So I'm looking here at this mask builder, and I'm going to turn down the contrast to see if that helps it soften up a little bit. Yeah, that's softening it up. It's still a little bit too perfect, right? Let's play with the grunge here. Yeah, it looks like the grunge is actually breaking it up. That's pretty good. I'm going to play with the scale. There we go. I'm just trying to, especially looking at this shape right here, because it was a little bit too perfect. If I set it back to how it was, it's just like this little perfect sort of pill shape, and it just doesn't look real. And now we have this other layer here called grunge leak small and if I turn that on a little hard to see what's going on again don't forget that you can alt click on your mask and then toggle things and you can see what it's actually doing so this is adding some noise and breakup but I think the dots are too big it doesn't look like the right scale so I'll click on my grunge leak small and I'll increase this tiling slider there we go that's pretty cool okay that's pretty good uh, let's not forget to adjust the dirt itself now this here is just kind of artistic license maybe this scene takes place in sort of an area with like more red dirt so i would i would make sure to match the dirt color of the scene that the shot is taking place in but just for this video i'm going to go with a little bit less saturated a little bit darker and now it looks like there's a little sharpened filter and this is what it sounds like it's a filter it doesn't actually add any color or any shininess anywhere it just sharpens up what's here so if you look really close at some of this noisy dirt you can see it gets sharper when i turn that on okay cool so i'm going to close this folder and now we've successfully sort of adjusted a smart material and now i can mask this folder off just like i did with the black plastic so let's click on the folder and i'm going to go add a black mask and then i'm going to switch to my polygon fill and i'll just click on the parts that i want to be yellow Okay, so we finished the torso. I think it looks pretty, pretty good. I think we're done with that. But I want the same materials on all of the other parts of the body, all the other texture sets, but I don't want to rebuild them. So what can I do? Well, we can actually turn these folders into smart materials that will appear over here. Uh, just to demonstrate that it's working, I'm gonna change the name to something really recognizable, like black plastic demo, so that we can find it in the list. Maybe same thing with the dirty chrome. So I'm gonna right click on my black plastic demo, and I'm gonna go to Create Smart Material, and here it is. I'm gonna do the same thing for the Dirty Chrome really quick. And then for the Steel Painted Material, it already is a Smart Material, but we did a lot of changes. I'm gonna go ahead and call that Demo and create a new Smart Material out of that too. Now the cool thing about changing the name is I can actually type the word Demo here, and it'll search for those materials that we just made. So the way we constructed the torso is we started with the Chrome on the bottom. So I'm gonna do that for the head as well. Okay, there's the Chrome, and then we added the black plastic material. Uh, I can see the black plastic actually didn't pop up and that's because there's a mask. So if you accidentally have a mask, just right click and go add white mask and you should see it. But actually I think we want it to be black for now so we can see the chrome. Okay, let's add the yellow on top and just to make sure it's nice and fresh and reset for us, I'm going to right click and go add a black mask. Okay, so for now the head is totally chrome, but let's pick out the areas we want to be black plastic. So I'm gonna click on my mask for my black plastic material, and then I'll click on the head. Now I can see that it's filling the entire model with black plastic. I don't know if I really want that. I think I still want these parts to be chrome on his head. So I'm gonna press undo, and let's try a different mode. Let's try the UV fill. So what does UV fill do? We can see I got the result that I was looking for, but what did it actually do? If I look at the 2D texture map, I can see what's happening is it's actually filling based on these UV shells and these little vents here are separate UV shells and so it didn't apply that black material to it. Okay, now I want the back of his head kind of from this line backwards to be the yellow material. So I'm gonna click on the mask for the yellow material here 
And I have a problem because if I click on this, it's going to fill everything, including the face. And I don't want that. I just want this sort of section that's sort of uh, behind this crease. And there's no way to really quickly click on that. So unfortunately, we're going to have to do a little bit of painting here. But we can switch here to the face mode and I can actually just drag over the faces that I want to be yellow. I'm going to do the big, broad, easy areas first, and then I'll dig in really close and kind of get that line worked out. Let's do the big chunk first. Again, I'm just dragging a box over all the faces that I want to be yellow. All right, there we go. That took a little bit of time, but we got it worked out. Okay, now it's just a matter of repeating that same process on the legs and the arms. So I'll just drag the chrome onto the arms and then the black plastic, and then I will mask the black plastic where I want it to go. Just picking out some spots I think look good. You can see once you get in the flow and you got your materials set up, it goes pretty quickly. You kind of just play with it, kind of just have fun. It's a very low friction process once you've got it all set up and ready to go. It's actually a really good looking robot. But if we don't get it out of Substance Painter and into some other program, it's pretty useless. So let me show you how to do that. It's a final step. I'm going to go to File, Export Textures. And we can see that all four texture sets are here. They're going to be exported. So if you want to see which maps are actually being output, we can click here on each texture set. And I can see I'm going to get a color, a roughness map, a metallic map, a normal map, a height map, which we actually don't really need because there's no height channel, and an emissive map, which we also don't need because there's no glowing going on yet. So we can actually uncheck this for each texture set. Okay, let's go back to global settings and let's point it where we want it to end up. Okay, that'll work. Uh, you can change your file type here, the bit depth, and all that good stuff. But I'm going to press export and we can see this list ticking by really quickly. It's actually very fast and it's done. Let's check it out. So here are our textures. We can see we have a color map for each texture set. Looking good. Should have a metallic map for each texture set. Here's our normal map and our roughness maps. So this is ready to be brought into Blender or Maya or Cinema 4D or even Unreal Engine. Once again, this version of the model is available to anyone with a free account or a pro account. So go ahead and download it and make your own really cool robot textures. Uh, feel free to refer back to this video. And if you do create anything cool with it, definitely share it with us on our Instagram by tagging us or post it on our Discord. And be sure to subscribe to this channel so that when that updated Blender rig comes out, you'll be ready to download it right away and start making your own animations. Alright, later creators!